the sad reality is that if I talk for an hour and mention the word transgender once and 99.9% .9 of that talk talk about any other issue, a lot of times people will come away with that saying, all she's talking about is being transgender. Welcome to At Liberty, a weekly show where we're gonna go deep on the civil rights and civil liberties questions of our time. I'm Molly Kaplan. This week, I'm talking to Senator Sarah McBride about her journey into politics and her role as the highest ranking trans lawmaker in America. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Molly. It's great to be on with you. I, I want to say, first off, a very, very belated congratulations on your victory. Um, thank you. I'm curious, what was it like the moment that you realized you had won? What did that feel like? Surreal, more than anything else. Um, I had the, I had spent the entire day, election day, out at different polling locations across the district. The final polling location I visited as polls closed was my old middle school and high school, uh, Cab Calloway. And so it was really special ending the campaign where so much of my journey started at that public school. And then on the way um, from from that polling location to what I hoped would be a, a victory party uh, with, with, with a small group of family and friends, I was in the car going, uh, one person driving me, and I was just clicking refresh on the Department of Elections webpage over and over and over again until about 15 minutes after polls closed, they uploaded the entirety of the absentee vote. And within seconds of refreshing that page, my phone lights up with a, a call from Danica Rome, uh, the first out trans state legislator um, in, in the country. Uh, and it was just so fitting that the first call that I got after seeing the numbers come in and, and knowing for sure that, that, that we were almost definitely going to win, um, that it came from someone whose shoulders I was standing on, who had done so much to support me and other trans candidates, really drove home the, uh, the, 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 the moment and hopefully the message that my election and the election of other trans candidates can send to trans young people across the country. To the extent that you can share, what did Danica tell you? Um, she, I picked up and she called me Slayer McBride <laughs> because in the primary we had won by a, a pretty significant margin and then in the general we won by a pretty significant margin. So that's what she started calling me uh, as election results kept coming in. Uh, and and she just shared how proud of how proud of me and and my campaign team she was, um, and uh, and said she couldn't wait for us to be able to celebrate in person together uh, once we got past COVID. But it was just it was there was so much work that had gone into to to winning. There was so much work that that our campaign team had put into a, a campaign that lasted a year and a half and went through a global pandemic. But it was a it was a long a long journey, um, year and a half, and frankly a long journey in in my own life to to that moment of seeing something come to fruition, to seeing something become a reality that for so long had seemed so impossible that it was almost incomprehensible to me. Well, let's talk a little bit about that because you started in politics long before you became a state senator. You were, among many things, student body president at American University where you were a student. Um, did you always know you wanted to be in politics? When did that first enter your mind? I was I was pretty young, um, probably pretty insufferable as a young person. Uh, no, I, I wanted to be an architect when I when I got older and I would read about all the different beautiful buildings across the world that that I thought were just one of the highest forms of art. And I stumbled across the White House and the U.S. Capitol. And in reading about those those buildings from an architectural standpoint at six years old, I then started reading about the history that occurred in those buildings. And I discovered that in many ways, the story of our of our country, the story of every chapter in those history books is the story of advocates, activists, citizens, um, and courageous elected officials working together to bring about seemingly impossible change to include more and more people into our understanding of we the people. And I think as a young person who at the same time was struggling with who I am and how I fit into this world, 
And so I, I got involved in politics because I thought that politics could be the place where we could make the most amount of change for the most number of people in the most number of ways possible and where hopefully I could help build a world where people like me and others could be treated with dignity, respect, and fairness. I'm, I'm curious about the hope you felt because um, our history books, especially um, you know, in elementary and high school, are not known for their inclusivity and um, you know, representation of 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 uh, uh, broadly speaking, a we the people. Um, did where did that hope come from? Because you know, I I growing up never once in a history book saw the word transgender. I didn't even see the word LGBT. Um, how how did you get hope? Was the hope in what was possible or was the hope really in what you were seeing as already laid out, like the progress already made? I think it was it was in both. It was both. It was in the progress that had already been made and in the possibility for progress that that change proved. You're absolutely right. Our history books struggle to encapsulate the entirety of the diversity of our community and all of the different people and, 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 and individuals who made that change possible. Um, and to your point in finding hope in those history books, I also saw very clearly very early on that no one quite like me had ever made it very far in those history books, at least no one who was out. And, and, and so the hope was clear, but also the message of maybe where I belonged was clear, which was that trans people couldn't have a seat at the table. But again, I think in, 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 in reading those history books and in finding the stories of social movements that are, are included, not enough, but are included in, in different chapters, seeing those were the, were the points that we are most proud of as a country when we reflect back on them. Um, seeing that people had transformed impossibility and a possibility on a whole host of issues for a whole host of different communities. Not enough change, but something demonstrated that we could do the same on LGBTQ equality and on so many other issues. And I think that that's always been the challenge of being a progressive is striking that ba balance between never being pacified by our progress, but also never forgetting how far we've come. Because the moment the moment we lose track of the change we've already brought, the moment we fall into the trap of thinking that nothing has ever changed is the moment we fall into a, a, a well of cynicism that will evaporate any kind of energy rooted in hope that we have to bring about the change that's still so urgently required of us. Um, and so that, that, is the, that is a challenge that progressives face. And I think for me, recognizing that history is a necessary ingredient for the path moving forward. You know, the, the political arena uh, from an outsider perspective seems like a challenging workplace environment, like on a good day, no matter who you are. And being trans in America, no matter the workplace, comes with huge road roadblocks uh, because of discrimination and legislation that targets trans people or doesn't do enough to put in place protections. Did you ever feel or think twice about going into politics because it just feels so like you'd be so vulnerable. Yes. At, 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 at several points in my life. I mean, when I was growing up, I did not think it was possible for a trans person to be involved in politics. And it wasn't that I wanted to run for office. I just wanted to, to have a role in our democracy. I wanted to be able to, 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 to advocate for change, whether that was as an advocate uh, 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 a campaigner, a uh, government official, regardless of where it was, I just wanted to be able to contribute to bringing about change, but it didn't seem possible. I mean, there weren't even that many examples of, of, of out trans people in advocacy in our political space at that point, publicly in our media. Um, and, and it's hard to be what you can't see. And so in many ways, my journey to coming out was a process of giving up on any potential to, ha to, to have a seat at the table or have a, have a role to play in our democracy. It, it, it was a process in many ways of mourning a future that I, I dreamed of, that I hoped for, um, but that didn't seem possible. And that mourning process 
eventually leads to acceptance, which was both the simultaneous acceptance of who I am, but also the acceptance that that would likely mean that there would be no future for someone like me. Um, Now, fortunately, in coming out, what I have seen is that the only things that are truly impossible are the things that we don't try. And as understandable as the fears that I had were, and as significant as the challenges and prejudices are in our society to this day, that as understandable as those fears were, in many cases, they were unfounded. And in many cases, they underestimated the ability for people to to meet our stories and our lives with compassion and empathy that could bring about the kind of change that's necessary. And I think also, if I remember that you came out wall um, at American University as the president, um, and that on the whole, um, you were warmly received, that that um, when you communicated, people for the most part were very positive and that your family is very um, accepting, um, though worried they were accepting. Do you think that that kind of community support shaped your being able to be brave in politics? Absolutely. Um, and, and in many ways, the support that I received, the privileges that I have as a white trans woman um, born into a, 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 a upper income family with a college education, um, with a supportive family, that those experiences, those privileges in many ways propelled me into advocacy work for two reasons. One is coming out was the hardest thing that I had ever done up until that point, And yet it was still relatively easy compared to the experiences of so many other people. And I, I felt like it shouldn't be a privilege to be able to keep your family. It shouldn't be a privilege to be able to keep your job or to be able to stay in school, to be able to be welcomed by your community. Those should be a right guaranteed to everyone, not a privilege for the few. And then the second reason why I felt a responsibility personally to go into advocacy work was because those privileges helped me to, 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 to shoulder whatever I would need to shoulder as a public advocate, that so many people are, 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 are trying to just survive day to day. And, and so those reasons really pushed me into advocacy work so that one, other people wouldn't have to do that. And two, so that the experiences I had would no longer be unique. Hmm. I also want to talk about your late partner, Andy, if if that's okay. Um, the two of you had such a beautiful love story. Can you tell us a little bit about how that relationship with Andy helped you understand what kind of leader you wanted to be? Absolutely. Um, that's a great way of asking the question because I think it, it, it connects with so many different aspects of my approach, my priorities, um, my values. Andy was truly the kindest, smartest, goofiest person I had ever met. Um, When we met, he was about three years older than me, working as an advocate, seeking to expand healthcare to underserved communities, including the LGBTQ community. Um, For those who who are listening who, who haven't heard of Andy before, he was a transgender man. He had come out a couple years before I did. And we met actually um, at a White House Pride reception. Um, More accurately, we bumped into each other. uh, And I'm ashamed to say I don't remember bumping into him, but he remembered bumping into me and and messaged me on Facebook with the cutest, most Andy message where he said that he thought we'd get along swimmingly. Um, In fact, I have a framed, um, someone did calligraphy of the message he sent me with the word, with the, with the (laughs) hi, so hi, I'm Andy. I think we'd get along pretty swimmingly. And I thought, who the hell says the word swimmingly? But clearly it's someone who I want to spend some time with. Um, and I, and I fell in love with him really quickly. Uh, about a year into our relationship, Andy was diagnosed with cancer And he was lucky to have health insurance. We were both lucky to have a flexible employer. We were working at the same place by that point. Uh, An employer who helped us take time off without having to sacrifice our income so that we could focus on him getting the care he needed. He got 
um, radiation, chemotherapy, underwent surgery, got a clean bill of health. And then about eight months later, he received the news that every single cancer patient fears that his cancer was back. It had spread and for him it was terminal. When we found out that Andy didn't have much time left to live, he asked me to marry him and we married on the rooftop of our apartment building in August of 2014. And then just four days after that, he passed away. And my relationship with Andy was the most formative experience in my own life. Um, he taught me how to love and be loved. But e even more than that, he showed me a couple of things. And my relationship with him showed me a couple of things. One, his work and his life demonstrated to me how the ability to get health care is a foundational human right. That if you can't get the health care you need to live, then in many cases, nothing else matters because you won't be able to survive. He showed me in so many different ways, both in his own interpersonal relationships, but also in, in the positions he would take, sometimes in arguments we would have, discussions that we would have, debates we would have, how to live the values I fight for at work in my own life. The importance of taking the values that you're fighting for and to, to, to embody them in your relationships with other people in your strategies and in your tactics that you utilize in your work, right? This sort of notion of deep values, deep principles that are rooted in kindness and compassion. Um, and then the final component of my relationship with Andy that, that I still think about every single day is the urgency of change. And after Andy passed away, I went through different stages of grief. And, and one of the things that I got angry about was the fact that Andy had died so young that he had only had about a quarter of his life as his authentic self. And that a lot of people have even less time than that. And for me, what that has, has kept front of mind is that every single time we ask people to allow for a slow conversation to take place before we treat them with dignity and ensure them opportunity, we are asking people to watch their one life pass by without the respect and fairness that everyone deserves. And that's just simply too much to ask of anyone. Another formative piece of, of your life seems to be the place that you were in and Delaware itself seems to have had a, a hand in, in forming Sarah McBride. How did um, your experience in Delaware also inform who you are as a politician and even your, your policy platform? Well, I, I, I think that one of the things I love about Delaware that I talk about that was really at the heart of a lot of my message as a candidate was that Delaware is a state of neighbors. That as a small state, we at our best feel a, a neighborly duty to care. Um, I sort of think of it as the politics of Mr. Rogers. And, and when done right, it can be a politics rooted in that radical compassion, um, a politics that can break through the physical, the ideological, the I identity divisions that we have in our society that can see people as people, as individuals with both unique and common hopes and dreams and fears and needs um, that can share in people's joy and also in their pain. And I saw it every single day during the course of the campaign and in the, in the goodness and the kindness of the people that I met in the hunger for a politics rooted in, in, in compassion and kindness and in the inherent goodness that the vast majority of people in the community have. And I think at a time in our politics when things seem so toxic and so broken and where oftentimes we're quick to point out what is wrong with everyone else, to be able every single day to see that that goodness exists, to fall more deeply in love with my own community in this state that I now have the privilege to represent, I think guided, motivated me and has guided me. Um, you know, government can't eliminate all loss. Government can't stop every kind of tragedy from occurring, but what government can do is it can 
help people weather those crises. It can help people face those hardships. It can help people get through and keep their head above water. I, I, I think one of the through lines in my entire life is that I face challenges, but I've been lucky because of the layers of privilege and luck and support that I've had, that I've been able to keep my head above water and get through those challenges and those hardships. But I know that if any one of those layers had been removed, I don't think I would have been able to make it through. And so recognizing that we have a responsibility to level that playing field, to not eliminate every loss or every tragedy or, or to stop every kind of hardship, but to be there and make a life and to make life a little bit easier for people so they can face those hardships and those challenges and get through them and thrive through them. And so for me, that philosophy has guided the priorities. It's been informed by the conversations I've had here. It means making healthcare a right for every single person the best we can at the state level while we pursue federal nationwide progress. It means Delaware joining the growing list of states that have paid family and medical leave for every worker. That's a huge priority of mine. It's one that I'm working on day in and day out. It means a quality education that's safe for every child, not just K through 12, but from early education onward. Um, it means a reimagined justice system that actually protects the dignity of every person. It means action on all fronts. Um, and, and I think that if we can tap into people's empathy and compassion, if we can bridge those divides, if we can allow people to see the humanity behind the policies we're talking about, I, I do think that we will not only have the public support, but also the public demand and action to deliver that kind of meaningful change. It sounds like a politics of how and not just what. That the, the what may change over time and depending on the circumstances, but how we do it, that is the piece that for you seems a little bit different? Well, I think the how is how we get to that what. I think the how is how we bring people in and how we we make sense of and make workable the system of government that we have. Um, right. And and I think it's 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 a politics that that recognizes that we can make bold progressive change while building bridges all at the same time. That those are not mutually exclusive, but in many cases go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. you know, you've marked a lot of firsts for our country. You were the first out trans woman to work in the White House as an intern for the Obama administration, the first trans person to speak at a major political convention in 2016, and now the first trans state senator. And, you know, most of us will never break a single barrier like that, let alone multiple barriers. And I'm wondering, what does it mean to be the first? And, and is, it, is it both a pressure and an honor? Or, and does it ever get hard to also always have the first attached to your name? First trans woman, um, you know, is sort of so many of the articles, um, the headlines say first, 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 um, but you're more than a first. Um, you know, I have a lot of thoughts about this and I think you actually just encapsulated so many of them in the question. Um, you know, first and foremost, being the first <laughs> only matters if I'm not the last. Um, I, I do view part of my responsibility as being as utilizing my role to not just leave a Sarah sized hole in the wall, but rather to help bring down the wall and the barriers that stand in the way of any kind of person fully participating in our society and our democracy. Um, it is both a responsibility and an honor. I'd much rather be the first than not have the opportunity at all and, and recognizing how lucky I am to have that opportunity, even if it comes with it certain unique challenges or unique responsibilities. Ultimately, I, I, I don't really think about it on a day-to-day -day basis, So I am so focused on the, the actual day-to-day -day work of my job that I don't think about the sort of symbolic responsibility I might have or the sort of more esoteric, ethereal responsibility that I have to the broader LGBTQ community because I know that the only way to fulfill any of those responsibilities is to do the best job that I can in this role, right? Is to do the best job for the residents of this district to bring about as much change as I can. And in bringing that change and in doing a good job, it will not only help to bring down those barriers, but it'll help to demonstrate to folks that 
when you elect diverse candidates, when you elect trans candidates, they're going to be effective change makers. They're going to be effective advocates for their communities. And they're going to be able to work on all of the different issues that they care about and that the community cares about. I think the biggest, one of the biggest challenges is cutting through the focus on my identity to demonstrate the full diversity of who I am as a person, of the passions that I bring, of the experiences that I bring, and of the work that I'm doing. Because I know the sad reality is that if I talk for an hour and mention the word transgender once and 99.9% .9 of that talk talk about any other issue, a lot of times people will come away with that saying, all she's talking about is tra being transgender. Uh, and we know that's true not just for trans candidates. It's, it's true for candidates of marginalized backgrounds, period. I mean, you saw when Hillary Clinton ran, they did a study of her rhetoric and her speeches, and the vast majority of her rhetoric was around jobs in the economy. And the discourse afterwards was, oh, she talked too much about social issues. She, you know, she talked too much about bathrooms. And that just is not the reality. But when we see mar candidates of different marginalized backgrounds come forward, we're primed and, 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 and honing in on messages or points that they bring up that might be the exception to what they're talking about, but we're ready and we're, we're, we're primed to think, oh, that person's a niche politician. They're only gonna care about women's rights or, LG or social issues, quote unquote. Um, and, and so demonstrating one, the breadth of my experience, but two, that all of these issues are inextricably linked, that you can't have an economy that works for everyone if you have anyone kept out of a job because of prejudice or discrimination, but you also can't have equality for everyone if you don't have an economy that works for all. And so breaking through that false distinction in our politics and also demonstrating the full breadth of my issues, my, my interests, and my work has been one of the major priorities that I've had as a legislator and as a candidate. Okay. After having just acknowledged the breadth of your work, I do want to say to talk a little bit about trans advocacy um, uh, with the caveat that obviously you care about many, many issues. Um, but, you know, having your perspective would be so helpful. Um, first, the House just passed the Equality Act, um, an act that prohibits discrimination based on a person's sexual orientation and gender identity in a bunch of places, employment, education, healthcare, housing, and expands the number of protected public accommodations. Um, what does the Equality Act mean to you? It's a great question. Um, the Equality Act is, like all public policy, not an end in and of itself, but rather a foundation. Um, the Equality Act would make clear that LGBTQ people are permanently and undeniably protected from discrimination. It will reinforce our values, our expectations as a society. It will affirm and reinforce the humanity of our community, the, the fact that we are part of the valued, rich diversity of our country and our world. Um, and it will lay a foundation it will provide recourse, it will help to prevent, and it'll help to, to, to reinforce for anyone what the right thing to do is. Because I think when, when anyone is, when, when all of us are confronted with something that's new or something that's different or something that we might not have experience with, some people respond immediately with prejudice, but a lot of people respond based on what they see as the expected response. And the more we change hearts and minds and the more we pass laws that protect people, the clearer the expectation is. And, and so I can't, I, I think we, we, we can't underestimate, a lot of times we talk about how do we have to change hearts and minds to pass laws or we do, do we need to pass laws to change hearts and minds? And it's a both and approach. We've got to change hearts and minds in order to get the support for these laws, but we also can't underestimate the fact that these laws, they speak to our values and they demonstrate to people what our society expects of a, of a, of a kind and, dig, and, 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 and dignified um, interaction. And so the Equality Act is a critical piece of legislation. It would affirm and confirm Supreme Court precedent that we now have, thanks in large part to the ACLU and the Supreme Court decision back in, in June of 2020 that said that sex protections protect LGBTQ people. 
It would ensure that in areas where sex protections don't exist, that we add sex in, that we add the LGBTQ community in, and it would modernize protections for protected communities across the board and public spaces. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's a critical next step in our country's journey toward a more just and perfect union. It's a critical next step to modernize our federal non-discrimination laws, and it's a critical next step in the fight for LGBTQ equality. I think also to your earlier point about making sure that we're marking and acknowledging progress that, um, you know, we sort of, at least I sort of take for granted at this point, uh, you know, marriage equality. And obviously that is a thing. But when I started the ACLU, it was not at all a thing. Um, And I didn't start that long ago, you know, 2015, 2013, when Edie Windsor was um, lead plaintiff in DOMA or, you know, Gemma Bergefell was lead plaintiff in um, a marriage equality case, you know, it was we take it for granted now. And so I think your your earlier point is well taken that um, these laws, the Equality Act, Supreme Court cases, um, sort of mark the progress that we hope to take for granted in time to come. Well, and I, and I think I, I, I think that that's absolutely right. And that's, that's, that's part of the beauty of progress, but it's also part of the challenge that we face because when we have change, future generations oftentimes take it for granted because they know no other world where that change didn't exist. Um, and, and, and so having those clear points of progress that we can teach people about, that we can find hope in, whether that's Supreme Court decisions or frankly, more powerfully, legislative action um, and, the, and the, the message that specifically legislative action sends on uh, to a community, to a country, and, and, and the kind of mark it makes in the history books, that's, that's really critical. It's critical for us today, but it's also critical for future generations to be able to find hope in so that they can continue to make progress moving forward. Right. Progress is never complete. It's, it's always a project. Um, you know, similar to the Equality Act's national reach, the ACLU um, in 2021 is focusing a lot on um, asking the Biden administration to sign an executive order, making it easier for trans and non-binary people to have accurate IDs. Um, and I was wondering what your experience with gender markers on IDs has been, and why is having an ID with an accurate gender marker and name important? Because I think that... Um, there's the risk with talking about advocating around IDs to think it's small. Um, it doesn't feel as big as, you know, healthcare, employment. Um, but can you explain why it is so important? Yeah. And, and I think like so many trans people, you know, I've had experiences prior early on and especially in my transition where my identity and my name on my, on my driver's license didn't match who I am. Um, and resulted in, in, in moments of fear, um, in, 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 frankly, moments of ridicule, um, and certainly moments where I was at risk of discrimination. I think all of us probably at some point don't realize how often we use identity documents, how, how often we engage with a driver's license or um, any kind of legal documentation that, that reflects our, our identities, whether that's in interactions with law enforcement, whether that's in, you know, purchasing certain items, whether that's in trying to get a house or a job. Our identity documents come into play in almost every aspect of life in some form or fashion. And when you have identity documents that don't reflect who you are, that out you, it puts you at risk of discrimination, even violence. But then there's also the more um, more sort of fundamental component of identity documents reflecting and affirming who we are, which is the message that it sends, the message that it sends to us as trans people that we are seen, and the message that it sends to the broader world that we are who we are. Um, That reinforcement of our dignity, of our humanity, of the validity of our identities, um, that goes a long way in, in changing hearts and minds. It goes a long way, again, in affirming who we are um, for people who might just be tuning in to this conversation, who are still on their own journey to understanding around who trans people are. And so having that government and having identity documents reflect that 
and to make very clear that trans women are women, that non-binary folks are non-binary, that, that trans men are men, um, that we are who we are, um, it, it, it can be, it can be life-saving, it can be life-changing, and it certainly can be life-affirming. It also feels like it shifts the power dynamic a little bit, that um, rather than somebody being able to question who somebody is, you know, a police officer pulling you over for a traffic violation, a security guard who's looking at your ID before you can get into a building, that um, being able to have your ID accurately reflect who you are means that you get to say who you are, not, you know, a police officer, not a security officer, you know, it just seems like a fundamental um, power dynamic shift. It puts us in, 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 in control over our destiny, over who we are, which is at the end of the day, the most fundamental, one of the most fundamental needs and desires that we have as people, not just trans people, but any of us to be able to define ourselves, to be able to, to, to control um, not only our destiny, but, but how the world interacts with us, um, to be able to direct that and, um, and, and it, it's an, it's one of the reasons why, you know, people think that, that, that conversations around names and pronouns seem so frivolous, but names and pronouns are the first way we affirm a person's humanity, right? It's, it's, it's the most common way we affirm a person's humanity. And, and what are oftentimes the first steps of, of everyone from bullies to governments that seek to repress? It's to remove people's names. It's to call people it. It's to it's to dehumanize. It's a dehumanization. Yeah, it's to dehumanize people, and it's typically the first step in that is the removal of names and pronouns by whether whether we're talking about individual bullies or whether we're talking about state sanctioned oppression. Point. Um, I also wanted to ask. You know, we we are starting to see once again an influx of legislation and conversations in the house among other places around um banning trans athletes in sports and you know the conversation is as you already know has particularly involved trans women and whether or not they should be eligible to play on um women's teams um for fear that they would have some kind of advantage um some kind of physical advantage um this seems to be just the latest frontier of a long going um spate of anti trans attacks um you know first maybe it was adoption and then bath and now sports. How do you look at this latest frontier? You know, why sports and what do all of these bands have in common with each other? So I, I, I think a, a couple of, uh, of things. One, we have continuously seen this encroachment uh, or this, this, this sort of diminishment of the terrain that anti-trans voices are forces are arguing on right at one point it was you know the entirety of the validity of trans people i mean certainly they're still arguing that but that was where the sort of mainstream debate was then it sort of moved to bathrooms and now it's sort of shrunk to this island of 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 athletics in, in many ways um but it's all part and parcel of the same goal which is to undermine the validity of trans people's identities um, whether they were, t whether they were just flat out saying trans women aren't women and trans women aren't real is the same argument that was at the heart of trying to ban trans people from restrooms consistent with their, with our gender identity. It was to say trans people aren't who they are. And similarly in the context of sports, it's a, it's an attempt to say trans people aren't who they are. And we will codify in law statements that, 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 that other eyes that stigmatize and that undermine the validity and reality of trans lives. Um, I think that, that, you know, <laughs> the total hypocrisy of folks who have long resisted any kind of parity and funding under title nine and any kind of meaningful investment in, 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 in women's sports are now suddenly hyper concerned about women's sports is, um, uh, you know, a, a, quite a leap of, 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 um, of priorities uh, and a change in tune. Um, and it just doesn't reflect the full diversity in the spectrum of gender that exists in, in our society and in women's sports in general, even if you take trans people out of the equation. Um, you know, by definition, the most successful athletes are sort of physiologically, biologically unique, right? 
And, 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 you know, you see in, in Michael Phelps, the, 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 the certain physical advantages that he has, no one talks about that. But suddenly when we get into the space of yeah. trans women, when we get into the space of intersex folks, when we get in the space of women of color, suddenly we start to use this language of unfair advantage. Um, when we don't do that in any other instances of, of particularly white men in, in athletics, um, or, or even really white women in athletics who reflect a broad range of skill and aptitude and, 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 um, and capacity. And so one, it just, it, it so ignores that fundamental truth and that broad diversity that just exists. But it's also no coincidence that these attacks around particularly trans youth in sports are also happening at the same time where we're seeing legislative attempts to undermine trans access to transition related care. Because all of this goes together, right? They say trans women, a trans 16 year old is gonna have a hypothetical competitive advantage because they've gone through you know, puberty based on their sex assigned at birth. And yet at the same time, want to exclude that youth from having any kind of access to the transition related care that would prevent that youth from going through traumatic, the, the traumatic experience of puberty based on their sex assigned at birth. And so they're, 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 they are, these acts, these, act, these attacks very much go hand in hand because it's not about access to care. It's not about competitive. It's not about access to care. It's not about competitiveness in sports. What it is truly about is making life so difficult for trans young people that they never grow up to be trans adults. And that doesn't mean they grow up to be cis adults. It means they don't grow up at all. And that tactic is not just in the LGBTQ space. I mean, we've seen that with reproductive health. We see that in a lot of spaces that if you just make it so hard and chip away, chip away, chip away, the assumption that magically it will all just disappear, that we will stop being who we are, that we'll stop needing the life affirming care that we need. And it, it has never worked out. Like, I don't know why it, it's still happening. I mean, it certainly is effective in some ways at, at making life harder. Um, but it doesn't erase anybody. Everybody is who they are. Right. It doesn't erase need. What it all, all that it does is it creates barriers to people living. Right. Right. Um, I do want to end by cheating a little bit and having you answer a question that I read you often ask yourself. Um, anytime someone has a marginalized identity, they can become pigeonholed or reduced in some way to only being that identity. And I read that you like to ask yourself, you know, how do you do justice by the trans community while also doing justice to your whole self? So Sarah, how, how do you do that? Well, it's, it's something that I, I, I think about every single day, as you mentioned, it's something that I, I, I certainly try to balance. I think it's being proud of who I am, unashamedly, unabashedly, vocally proud of who I am as a trans person, recognizing that that is a part of me that enhances who I am, that, that, that I, am, I am grateful for. It is a perspective that I am proud to bring to the table in this legislature. But to also, so to never shy away from that, but to also make clear that I am a full human being with a whole host of identities, many privileged, many marginalized, some marginalized, different ex life experiences, some great, some hard, but that I bring all of myself to the table. And that includes all of the different issues that I'm passionate about, which are also issues that trans people, that LGBTQ people face every single day. My governing philosophy is rooted in the Audre Lorde quote that there's no such thing as a single issue cause because no one lives single issue lives. And I think if we remember that in our governing, while also being proud of who we are and never shying away from sharing that pride, I think that all of us can, can, can strike that balance of doing, doing justice to our communities and to our identities and to ourselves and to our wholeness. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for this conversation and for taking the time out from what I'm sure is a very busy uh, just life <laughs> right now. So thank you. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on and for this great conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. To get more of these conversations, subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell or subscribe to At Liberty wherever you get your podcasts.